Hello everybody, welcome to the United Stands. Sir Jim Radcliffe, the new partial owner of Manchester United, has been speaking in an exclusive interview about the stadium, about transfers, about his ideal player that he would bring to Manchester United. No more Mbappes, no more big spendings, the future of Eric Ten Hag, what he wants and why he wants to bring more heroes to Manchester United. Lots and lots to digest in a major interview from Sir Jim Radcliffe. And we're going to be unpicking that over the next few minutes and getting your thoughts on it. So let's start. First of all, this is what he had to say. Manchester United, you need to get your organisation right and you need to populate it with best in class. I think this is absolutely music to the ears of any Manchester United fan. This is, absolutely has to happen. What it means for Ten Hag, what it means for transfers, what it means for Stadia... Well, it's fundamental. You have to have that structure in place and we have to have best in class. And what I feel sometimes is, and look, I'm not saying that Ineos are going to get everything right. That They're working with the Glazers for a start. They still are here. We forget that. But I do and am starting to hear words that I think we've spoken about for years on this channel. And you hear it on social media and you hear it from other United fans as well. Best in class. Those three words are so important. Best in class. Because if you have that then it's harder to fail than what we have had. I mean, I was doing some... I'm doing a piece on an, on a transfer from the past at the moment, and I was doing some research this morning, and I was just looking at it and how the warning signs were there, and other clubs stepped away and went to do other deals, and United stayed in the race and paid... Not only stayed in the race for the player, but paid... We were in the, the only horse left in the race and we paid ridiculous money. That's not best in class. So I think that's really, really important what he has to say about that. Also, he had this to say. It's not a light switch. At Manchester United, much longer road to travel because there's so many aspects of the club and the game you have to get right. And I think what we're saying here is that patience. Patience is going to be key. Now, whether that's patience with building Old Trafford, whether that's patience on getting into a title race, whether that's patience with an individual like Ten Hag. Hopefully it's not patience with players because I think we've got enough of a CV there to, to decide what we're going to do with that. But patience is going to be key. And that's, that's going to, probably going to be the hardest thing because we've been patient for over a decade. We've seen this cycle for a decade of new manager, investment, three years later, manager goes. And we are going to have to be patient. We're almost going to have to get our minds in a reset that the last 10 years, and this is a horrible thing to say, but we almost need to be in a situation where we say the last 10 years are a write-off. Yeah, there was a couple of trophies in there. Europa League, some good goals here and there, the odd good result, but it's not Man United. And, and, and I think we need to write that 10 years off and look at patience. He spoke about Sir Jim Radcliffe as well. It's a collective, but Sir David Brailsford is the one in right in the middle of all this. It's where you start. You need the right organisational structure. In the old days of Sir Alex, he was the manager. Well, we don't have the managers today. We have a coach and the coach will normally report to a sporting director and a sporting director will report to the CEO. Have got no problem with this at all. Um, I'd be stunned if any of you did. This is exactly what Manchester United need to do. It is the structure that we need. Manchester City have a CEO, a sporting director and Pep Guardiola. Liverpool have the same with Klopp and Arsenal have the same with Arteta. And they are the three best clubs in the country at the moment. The fact that Man United haven't had this structure is, is incredible. And we 100% need to get ourselves in this position where we have this ASAP. So that's all your structure chat at the top. It's all very obvious, but look, it's Jim Radcliffe talking, so we have to take have to take note of that, uh, and I think that's really really important. What about the signings? What about you know other clubs and how they behave? Well, so Jim Radcliffe had this to say on on Real Madrid: the solution isn't spending a lot of money on a couple of great players. They've done that. If you look at the last ten years, they've spent a lot of money, and he's talking about Real Madrid and how they've done that. Um, the first thing we need to do is um, is to get the right people in, the right boxers who are managing and organising the club and make sure we get recruitment right. That's such a vital part of running a football club and getting that right. And he goes on to say, I would rather find the next Mbappe 
than spend a fortune to buy success. It's not that clever to go down and sign Mbappe. Anyone can fi figure that one out. And I think what he's saying here is, and, and, and the context of it, again, is always key. Um, Real Madrid do spend a lot of money and they're going to spend it on, on, on Mbappe. Of course they are. Um, that is without doubt going to be massive. But what I would say is that um, uh, Ferocious says, how, can, how come you can't play back video clips of the interview? Copyright strikes. Anyone who does that's an idiot. But the point is, you, you've you thrown me off now. But what, we're talking about this. Like, if you're Real Madrid and if you're Manchester City, you dominate the league you're in. We've mentioned this before. Man City could spend £100 million on João Neves. Real Madrid can spend on Mbappe or Erling Haaland or something like that. Because for whatever reason, whether their clubs have been run well or whether they've got away with things and we'll leave that for somebody else, they have a scenario where they have the ability every year to spend a lot of money. And they're adding pieces to the jigsaw, I suppose. Manchester United are not a jigsaw. Manchester United are what you see at the bottom of a pigeon loft. It's full of shit and sawdust. And it needs clearing out. So if you drop, if you drop, I don't know. I mean, look, look. If you drop a, a diamond into a load of horse shit, it's gonna stink of horse shit. And and that's basically what you what what Sir Jim Radcliffe's saying. We can buy a diamond. We can spend all our money on a diamond. But if you drop it into what's there already, it just becomes and smells the same. What we need to do is clear all that out and build from the bottom, the foundation. And maybe in a few years' time, we will just be able to top it up. I mean, I go back to what Roy Keane said in 2000. We'd, we'd won the treble, and we got knocked out and in 2000, I think it was, or 2001 in the Champions League. And he said we had an opportunity after the treble winning side to just bring in one or two world-class players and add to what we've got, and we haven't done it. We've stood still. And... He was right at that point. United at that time were on top of the world, the best team in the world. And we sort of stood still a little bit. We didn't actually start adding year after year after year. And, and this is what Man City can do at the moment. And this is what Real Madrid do do. United can't do that. This is where, you know, signing an Mbappe would be stupid because you um, we will we will lose most of our budget on one player. That one player comes in. They're brilliant but they're not surrounded by structure. That one player comes in, they get injured. It, it, it's too fragile. It's too fragile. And we don't have the manoeuvrability to do it. I would rather find the next Mbappe. I would rather find that than spend a load of money on success because we've tried that for 10 years. So I agree with Sir Jim Radcliffe on that. And I think it's really important that that we understand that, that, that that's not going to be the way. And, and it, it wouldn't have been the way with Qatar. I think we'd be financially better off with Qatar. And, and, and it's always... Interesting, because I think there's going to be a story that breaks about them very, very soon. But they're not going to take over Man United. It didn't happen. If they had done, we wouldn't be in debt. They probably have built the stadium themselves. But they still would have had to battle with FFP. And even if we had Abu Dhabi or Qatar or Elon Musk or whatever, and we had a full ownership and, and, and clearance of the debt, that would help us in many ways. But in the short term, you've still got to build the structure. And the structure doesn't get built in FFP because you can't go and spend six, seven, eight hundred million pounds on eight players. So we've got to build that structure first. And I think that's what he's talking about. Um, the this 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 was this for me was brilliant. Okay, so he was asked what player he would bring to Manchester United um if he could. And he said Paul Scholes. I think that's the player that's most missing. Casemiro and Mainu are sort of quite defensive midfielders, but they don't have a Scholes or an Iniesta at Manchester United. Now, I don't actually have a problem with this. I don't know what your thoughts are, but I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, God, if he'd said Fellaini, I think we, we'd all start crying. Paul Scholes at Man United is a legend. He's a great player. And the only question I would have asked of Sir Jim would have been, in what, what, what Paul Scholes are you talking about? Are you talking about prime Paul Scholes who got forward and scored goals? Or are you talking latter years Paul Scholes who almost became a bit of a carrick? And sat deeper because I think if you are going for prime Paul Scholes, he goes and gets in the box. You know, Paul Scholes used to score a lot of goals by arriving in the box. So you're using Mainu and Casemiro as the holders and you're letting Paul Scholes be the attacking player. 
well, what's, what are we doing with Bruno, Mount, Ericsson and McTominay? Because you've just made them all redundant because Skulls ain't getting dropped for any of them. So it's interesting how different fans see different things. For me, it's Paul Skulls. Or, or it's not... No, I've got that wrong. For me, I'd bring back Roy Keane or Michael Carrick. Because if I bring back Roy Keane or Michael Carrick, I stick them in the holding midfield role. I put Casemiro next to them or I let Casemiro go. I put Mainu next to them as the eight and I keep Bruno or Mount. So I would have gone for a, you know, a Carrick or a Skull, a Carrick or a Keane to hold the midfield. Skulls did do it in latter years, but not to the quality of a Keane or a Carrick. So it's interesting that how Sir Jim Radcliffe looks at it and goes, I'd like a Paul Skulls in that team. And he sees Mainu and Casemiro as defensive options because I don't. I think Casemiro may well be coming towards the end of his time uh, as a top defensive midfielder. And I don't think Kobe Mainu is a defensive midfielder because what are we going to do with this amazing ability to dribble and take people on? As a holding midfielder, that doesn't work. So interesting from, from Sir Jim. He is just a fan who happens to be a billionaire and he's not the director of football. So we don't need to worry about if he's if he's read the room right there. A lot of people actually agreed with him on that. Personally, I quite like the fact that he's gone for someone for, for, for like Paul Scholes because he's going for a little bit, of, uh, little bit of quality. But, you know... It's all about opinion. Um, there was an interesting thing I just wanted to bring in as well that he said about... Um, he he said that... Um, he was talking about, like, aura and talking about Manchester United. And it was interesting because, obviously, there was that comment about Paul Scholes. But there was also a comment around um, Manchester United and... I'm going to talk about the stadium and Ten Hag in a minute. But he said this. There's always been a bit of glamour when it comes to Manchester United. George Best, Sir Bobby Charlton, Eric Cantona. It's something we never forget. But it's an element of United. And we're a bit thin on glamour over the last decade. And I quite liked that because I grew up on that. I grew up on, you know, Cantona and, you know, Beckham. And, you know, then we latterly had Rooney and Ronaldo. And there were other players as well who had that sort of quality about them, that aura. And um, we are lacking that. But that's that will come with the right players. Um, we don't need to go out and buy a Cantona because of his personality. You will get that if you bring in the right players. We just haven't brought the right players in. That's 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 the main thing for me. Um, talking about Ten Hag then, I know we touched on it a little bit this morning. He was asked about the title. He said, I, I hate them all. But he did say this. It would be good for Arteta. Um, he's done really well there. And Arsenal have been patient with him, which is nice as well. And that was when he was asked about the league table, uh, who, who's going to win the league title. I, I think that really um, that is so positive for Eric Ten Hag um, uh, in the sense that um, apparently Kobe Mainu has been called up into the England squad. Breaking news. England have called up Kobe Mainu. So we'll talk about that in a moment. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I don't know whether somebody... Has, has somebody dropped out then? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But, um, yeah, I think this is such a massive point in relation to Eric Ten Hag because we've been waiting for this sort of thing for a long time. And I think the way it's come out is almost odd. This is not an exclusive interview with the BBC or anything like that. This was with a, with a cycling um, podcast where they've asked him a few questions. And I think that... To say that we've been asking for something to come out about the manager from Ineos for a long time, for it to drop in a podcast like this is quite interesting. But I think the rawness of this is really interesting because it's not like he's prepared to be speaking about the manager. Um, but I think he's dropped a massive hint that by saying, well, look, you know, Arsenal have done a great job with Arteta and they've been really patient with him, which is nice as well. I was listening to him when he said it and it was almost a throwaway comment but you can tell he really meant it because he, he could have just stopped at, you know, Arteta's done a job there. But then he sort of went and, you know, Arsenal have been really patient with him, which is nice as well. And it was an it was an admiration st statement. He was sort of almost like throwing it in there as, you know, what Arteta's done, Arteta's done well. And Arsenal have been really patient with him, which is really nice, which is obviously something that is at the core values of Sir Jim Radcliffe. Like, he obviously admires that from Arsenal, giving that patience. So it would be odd if he was then not going to be patient with Eric Ten Hag. So, look, 
I will still say there's a lot of games to go this season and there's a lot of potential losses that could make it very difficult for Eric Ten Hag to stay. But I think if Eric Ten Hag navigates the next two months without any major dra dramas, and I mean like two or three losses in a row, then I think he will get that patience in the summer, which I think is fundamentally massive for Manchester United. And I said it on Twitter this morning. I think it's a massive hint that Eric Ten Hag will stay at Manchester United because there are three things that sort of, you know, are massively important with regards to this. First of all, we need a massive clear out in the summer. Second of all, we don't have loads of money to spend. And third of all, it will cost money to sack Eric Ten Hag. Well, the money to pay Ten Hag off and replace him, the money to give a brand new manager and the clear out that won't happen as severely with a new manager. We need a clear out to raise money to buy players. If you've got a new manager coming in, I mean, can you imagine Gareth Southgate walking into Manchester United and to Jim saying, we need you to sell players to generate money. He wouldn't have a bloody clue what to do. So I think that's massively important as well. Um, what else uh, did he say? Well, look, I want to talk about the stadium next as well. Really interesting, this sort of stuff. The plans that are in place already, I suppose, when it comes to uh, Manchester United. He was also asked who is who is the greatest player to ever play for Manchester United. Um, who do you think he said was his greatest was the greatest player to ever play for Manchester United? Because his age profile is really interesting. Like Sir Jim Radcliffe's a lot older than most of us, and he, I mean, what he's seventy. He's seventy, isn't he? So seventy when you're 20, 50. So he was about, he'd have been about 10 in the mid 60s. He'd have been about 12 when we won in 68. So he would have, you know, 12 year olds, you know things, don't you? He would know about um, Sir Bobby. He'd have seen Sir Bobby. He'd have seen George Best. He'd have seen Dennis Law. He'd have seen Brian Robson. So, Guess who he said that the best player to play for Manchester United is? Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo is the guy. Um, look, I have read the chat about Kobe Mainu, but I'm doing a video about Sir Jim Radcliffe and the future of our football club. Kobe Mainu getting called up for England, great news, really doesn't move the needle on what I want to talk about. So congratulations to Kobe Mainu. He's going to go and train with England. You've had your piece. I've told you about it. I'm not doing a separate video about it. I'm talking about Man United and the structural future of our football club. Bloody hell. I mean, how many times do you have to say it? So Jim Radcliffe asked who the greatest player to play for Man United is. Cristiano Ronaldo, which I was a bit surprised about. Um, he's, he's, he's the greatest player to play for Man United in my lifetime, I think, on pure talent. But I'd be interested to know what Ricky's answer is to that because he might say something different. Um, but I was surprised by that because I can't say George Best. I can't say Sir Bobby Charlton because I didn't see them play. But that was uh, Sir Jim's answer on that. Um, and again, just another comment on uh, this. He says, it's not where our focus is buying Jude Bellingham. The solution isn't spending a lot of money on a couple of great players. They've done that for over 10 years. So that's not what Man United are doing about. Um, he spoke also about Barada. He said, we talk on a daily basis. There's a group of us involved, but the two most focused on it is Dave and myself. We've now got Barada, of course, who's on gardening leave at the moment, but become, but he's becoming part of a trio when he settles in. So that, that conversation isn't actually going on at the moment because he's on gardening leave, of course, and you've got to be very uh, aware of that. Um, he said that Sir David Brailsford wouldn't ever profess to say we need to buy that player because I think he's a very good player. Dave would never do that. It's not his skill set, but we we need that skill set at the football club. What I was really interested in is sort of the business side of Sir Jim Radcliffe. So bear with me on this one because I think this is quite interesting what he had to say here. So basically, he was talking about Old Trafford. And remember, there's been a little bit of a lack of clarity around this and what's actually going on. So this is what he had to say. I think Man United are the biggest sports brand in the world, so it needs to have a stadium that is befitting the club and the brand. Uh, it might have been the case 20 years ago that Old Trafford had that stadium, but if you look at where Real Madrid are doing at the Bernabeu and the Barcelona with the new camp, and you look at the Premier League, we don't have anything that compares to that. Um, we can refurbish Old Trafford and do a really nice job of that, and it would cost about a billion pounds, and the club could shoulder that burden. But you have got the opportunity, if you choose to, to build a completely new ground and it would be state of the art, 90,000 to 100,000, that provides a platform for something, uh, some of the big competition being in the north. 
um, you know, he's talking about the Wembley of the North. So that, that that's real clarity for you there. Old Trafford, can we can stay at Old Trafford, we can refurbish it really nicely and we can spend a billion pounds on it and we make it look really nice and we stay at Old Trafford. Or we can knock it down, build a new, sta new stadium and, you know, have a Wembley of the North. I personally would say let's spend a billion pounds on our ground. It's our ground. It's it's our church. Um, it means a lot to a lot of people. I still want us to refurbish Old Trafford. But obviously, I think that they're, they're still looking at that. Uh, he said that unquestionably Man City are the top of the pile and Liverpool are up there too. If you look at the Northwest, it's not Manchester United, that's for sure. And obviously that's his challenge. But he said, look, look. This is interesting. This is a bit. This is the businessman of Sir Jim Radcliffe. I think the future of football. It's not going to be you just go to a football match, you leave and you go home, uh, or where we are today, where people have to leave early because the transportation systems can't cope with the rush because there's nothing else to do. The future is to provide more entertainment and you keep the fans at the ground. This is an issue with financial fair play. If you can get people to spend more time in the ground, spending a couple of quid on some food and stay for a couple of hours afterwards, it's good for the club and fans can have a better time and we can buy better players. And this is interesting because this is how we're looking at with Manchester United and um, this is how a businessman looks at it. You, you go to a match day and you might get there a couple of hours early. You might go corporate. You might go in the bar. You might go around the corner in the Bishop's Blaze or the Trafford or, you know, you might be in Manchester. You're, you're, you might be at Nando's. You're doing all that before the game. You go to the game. You watch the game. People leave early. People stay a little bit late. It's all about the traffic. What Sir Jim Radcliffe is saying is they want to, what they clearly want to do is build the stadium and build stuff around it so that fans are spending money around there. You know, if you're buying food, it's going into United's pocket. If there's a, a if there's some entertainment, it goes into United's pocket. And the more fans spend money around the club, the more they can then spend on players. Um, which is interesting because a lot of money does get spent by Manchester United fans as it is anyway. Like when you think about things like this, when you think about you know stadi season tickets, stadium tours. So it's but but look, this is the way football's going and. Um, Clubs are having to find ways to boost their revenues. And I think Sir Jim Radcliffe is a business guy is going to look at that. And I think that that is exactly what we're trying to do with regards to um, this this stadium rebuild. Very interesting. Ten Hag needs to be binned. Southgate's the future. There's always an idiot in the chat, isn't there, Ibs? I'm, I'm, I just won't read them. Any. I, you know what? I try and be polite because you've done a £2 super chat. So I try and be nice. But in future, I just I think we're getting to the point where we just don't read them. Jehan, welcome to the Members Club and Ronaldo. Um, uh, Jehan also says, I'm just enjoying an owner that communicates, Mark. And Gunnar Station says, if it's Man United versus Chelsea final, who will break their Wembley curse, Mount or Poch, says Gunnar Station. Well, we're a long way off getting to that, I think, at the moment. But I think with regards to the actual interview, as much as a lot of you want to talk about Mainu being called up for England, which I don't give a shit about, to be honest. I'd rather he wasn't. I don't want him to go to the Euros, even though I know he should do. I want him to not be burnt out by by Southgate or anybody else, but it's good for the lad. Um he's better than he's better than he's better than the under twenty ones. But I did say there'd be some big interviews dropping over this international break. I didn't expect it to be from Sir Jim on a cycling podcast, but there's just so much in there. Um, and I think the takeaways are transfer plans are going to be around recruitment of talent rather than big names. We're going to buy cheaper rather than more expensive, well-recruited, younger players. I think around Ten Hag, he's got a massive opportunity to stay and the patience will be there if he can if he can navigate the next two months. I, I think that around the structure, they want best in class. We've seen hints of that already. And I think that they're looking to build that structure and overarching all of that, whether it's recruiting younger talent, whether it's sticking with Ten Hag, whether it's about building the structure, overarching, it's not a light switch. It's going to take patience. And um, it's we're, we're going to have to be that because there's no alternative. Uh, what do you think about Ericsson's interview? I think we need to sell him this summer to space. Well, I'll probably talk about it a little bit later, mate. I've got a massive list, list of stuff. Oh, I'm nearly choking here. I've got a massive list of stuff to talk about on the eight o'clock show already. And I think we'll just slip Ericsson into that as well. Uh, anyway, look, thanks everyone for watching. 
Apologies that Mainu got called up to the England squad in the middle of a completely different type of video. And I'm not going to swerve away from that because I wanted this video to stand alone as what it is. Uh, take care, everyone. Get your comments in below if you're not watching live. What were your thoughts on what Sir Jim Radcliffe have to say? Is it all positive? Are there some negatives in that? Let me know. Take care. I'll speak to you in a bit.